and this is something my dad used to always say. We hold these truths to be self-evident. He said, you know, that's just a highfalutin way of saying any idiot should get this. That's the voice of Ken Blackwell, a nationally respected conservative commentator, author of multiple best-selling books, and a current senior fellow at the Family Research Council. Today, we bring you a special message from him on why we can't make comfort our highest value, especially when the destruction of our families and our Constitution are at stake. Welcome to Speak Up Virginia, equipping you to speak up on the life, family, and freedom issues that matter most to you. From the Family Foundation, I'm your host, Candy Cushman. Well, welcome, everybody. Glad to have you with us for another episode of Speak Up Virginia. And I am really glad to have with us a special guest today, Jesse Blakely, State Director of Family Foundation Action. That is our sister organization. And among other things, Family Foundation Action does a great job putting out voter guides to help educate people, but they also do a lot of election election related activities like knocking on doors and that sort of thing. Tell us a little bit about Action. Yeah, so thanks, Candy. And uh, for those of you who may not be familiar, Family Foundation Action is committed to helping conservatives get elected. So Family Foundation works really well to craft policy and, and lobby at the grassroots level uh, for changes. But in order for us to have people to lobby, uh, for, for y'all to have people to talk to, we need to get them elected. So Family Foundation Action does that uh, by surveying candidates who are running for office to determine who aligns with us on principles. And then, like Candy mentioned, we put out voter guides. Uh, we also do scorecards for the General Assembly that comes out uh, through Family Foundation Action every two years. So you can tell uh, not only how your elected officials are doing, uh, but maybe consider uh, who you're going to vote for. And then, like Candy mentioned, we do stuff like uh, volunteer door knocking days, uh, we make phone calls, we send text messages to remind conservatives who might not remember that there is an election to show up and, and make sure they know who's on the ballot. I don't know who doesn't remember there's not an election, but I know those people are out there. <laughs> well, I know I, it's hard to ignore in Virginia since we have an election every year. <laughs> All right. Well, in addition to Jesse being here, I, I did want to bring her on because I wanted to um, have a special treat for all of you today, and that is a message from Ambassador Ken Blackwell. Jesse, tell us how he ended up being a speaker for Action and maybe a little bit about him. Yeah, so um, Family Foundation Action held a dinner um, over the spring, and we were looking for somebody to bring in who had really a wealth of experience, um, not only in elections, but also as a really strong champion for conservative principles serving in office. Um, and Ambassador Blackwell has just a fantastic um, career history and resume and, and shared with us some, some really wonderful insights uh, while he was here. And I think encouraged a lot of folks to um, get involved in, in helping find those conservative champions here in Virginia. Yeah, there's not much he hasn't done in the political sphere, but just kind of run through the, the resume here a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. So. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar with Ambassador Blackwell, he was the U.S. Ambassador to the United Nations and the Human Rights Commission. Um, he also currently serves as a Senior Fellow for Human Rights and Constitutional Governance at the Family Research Council, which I think Candy, Candy mentioned in the intro. Um, and then he is also uh, a former elected official, so he formerly served as the Mayor of Cincinnati, uh, as well as serving as the Ohio Secretary of State. Uh, and then he was appointed as undersecretary for the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development. So he really has just a long list of fantastic accomplishments, and we were blessed to have him with yeah, us. Yeah, there's too many to mention here, but you get the idea. But I know everyone is going to enjoy this message because he really brings a unique experience being in politics at all levels and even internationally. So he's got a, a really good um, focus on races and why they're important. He's going to talk to us about that. Um, but also, you know, not only why the presidential race is important, but also why people need to engage on the most basic level in the neighborhood. So 
Um, Jesse, I do want to hear your thoughts on some of that after he talks. Um, but just before we get into this speech from Kim Blackwell, um, I did want to mention that everyone's going to notice if they're watching on YouTube that the attorney general is sitting right there beside him. Our state attorney general, Jason Mears, is sitting right beside him the entire time. Tell us why that's happening. Yeah, so uh, along with Ambassador Blackwell, we were really excited to be joined at our dinner by uh, the Attorney General, Jason Miares, who uh, many of us know and, and love. And so he spoke for a little bit as well. And I think uh, we may be able to share that later on uh, with y'all through the podcast. So, yeah, I'm hoping next week to follow this up. Uh, Victoria will be back in town. We'll be able to cover some news updates, but I'm also helping to um, hoping to share part two um, featuring Jason Miares next week. So stay tuned for that. But without further ado, let's hear from Ambassador Blackwell. Let me just tell you, at this point in our almost 250 year history, there is a threat. It's a threat because folks have lost sight of what makes us unique. I'm gonna borrow from my family because the family is the incubator of liberty. Aristotle said it best, that there is a dynamic tension between individual liberty and the muscularity of the state. The more muscular, the more powerful, the more concentrated the power in the state, the greater the threat to individual liberty. <clears throat> and one of the things that the founders of our country understood was that power and authority was not in the state, but in our creator. Amen. We hold these truths, and this is something my dad used to always say. We hold these truths to be self-evident. He said, you know, that's just a highfalutin way of saying any idiot should get this. <laughs> are created equal, that we're endowed by our creator with certain unalienable rights. Now, just think about that. Our rights don't come from government. Our rights come from God. Amen. I've crisscrossed 67 countries over the last 55 years. I've seen communists, socialist countries, and I've seen us when we're at our best. Lincoln said it, we're not perfect, but we are perfectible by men and women engaged in the process. One of the things that I know about communist and socialist governments is that they try to do two things. They run God and faith out of the public square, and they destroy the family. They build a dependency on government. They use the largesse of big government to wean us off our liberty. We, by nature, seek equilibrium. We don't like to be off balance. But sometimes you have to take a risk. You can't find comfort in the e equilibrium of the loss of your liberty and the destruction of your family and the destruction of the greatest constitutional republic in all of human history but it's about choices. It's about making choices. And that's what this is about tonight. Will we be engaged? Will we do what we can with what we have? Will we recognize the threat? Will we give the money so that we have the resources to knock on doors and to carry a message? 
I will just tell you, I've, I've, I've watched and I've talked to Mark and, I've, and I'll just tell you, there have been times when we've been on the brink before. There have been crucial elections before. But this is pretty straightforward. In this country, there are 3,100 counties. There are over 175,000, 175,000 precincts. And the question is, will we engage at the most basic level of the political process, neighbor to neighbor, church member to church member, family member to family member? I'll tell you, in 2004 in Ohio, it was nip and tuck between George Bush and Kerry. We had an issue on the ballot that says marriage is a union between one man and one woman. At that, in, during that election, the Democrats and the Republicans had handheld computers. <laughs> the Democrats flew in a lot of college students who didn't know the neighborhoods, didn't know the people. With their handheld computers, they knocked on doors. We beat them that year because who was holding our handheld computers were family members, neighbors, church members, knocking on doors, making that appeal. We had on the ballot that issue of marriage. And I'll just give you an example. What George Bush was only getting about 8% of the black vote across the country, he got 18% of the black vote in Ohio in that year. And he won by a nice size margin, which let me just say, as we go into next year, I, I, I've done elections. There are human enterprises. They're, they can be full of mistakes. You have bloated voting rolls. And you know Willie Horton, when they asked why did he rob banks, he said, because that's where the money is. <laughs> <laughs> the issue is, why do folks who want to fix the elections go to voted, bloated voter rolls? Because that's where the opportunity is. But the one way that we can guarantee that we, in fact, are not overtaken by manipulation and rigs is by making sure that the margin it's too big to rig. Yes. That has to be your battle cry going into this next election for the seventh district. We want to make the margin of victory too big to rig by making sure that neighbor to neighbor, church member to church member, family member to family member, that we are carrying a message that folks know what is at stake. If we do that, we will win. This is an institution dedicated not just to the family, but to those public policies that allow families to thrive, to flourish, and to contribute to the improvement of the human condition. That's what our message has to be. Ronald Reagan said, if we ever forget we are all one nation under God, we will be a nation gone under. And we can't be apologetic by saying we check the strength, the muscularity, the complexity of government to maintain not only our liberty, but a cultural recognition that we are one nation under God.
If, in fact, you are ashamed or bashful about saying that, we won't win. But if, in fact, we carry that message and we support men and women who stand for limited government, free enterprise, and our national sovereignty, we will win. And again, let me just, I, I have to be careful because I don't want to ever put anybody's um, legal, uh, what do you call it, that term? Legal was, jeopardy? Yeah, in, well, in, in jeopardy, I, this is very part, I'm, this is me, I own this, this is a partisan statement. <laughs> And I, and I do this all the time. Yeah. Let, me, let me just say this, let me frame it. I'm a big believer in time management. And I understand only 24 hours in a day, and so time is precious. So I have stopped after 76 years. I no longer argue with idiots. <laughs> And I'll go back to something that my dad told me about time management. He said, son, bees don't waste time debating with flies that honey is better than dog poop. <laughs> and I will just tell you that there's one party, the Republican Party, that needs to stop acting like it's the minority party yeah. in the United That's States. Right. Yeah. 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 And it doesn't, it needs to draw a contrast mm -hmm. by what we stand for. Mm -hmm. And we must, in fact, understand that that's a way to maintain a majority status. <laughs> that's the way to run the trifecta mm -hmm. in November win the, the majority in the House, win the majority, keep the majority in the House, win the majority in the Senate, and send Biden packing. Mm -hmm. yeah. If we don't do it, <laughs> it is important that we do that for this reason. If we lose the majority in the House, they will impeach Trump even if he wins. Mm -hmm. They will impeach him and tie him up. First day, First day that's right. Mm. Second, if we don't get the majority in the Senate, they will tie up his appointments to the cabinet even if he, even if he wins. And if we lose the presidency, Lord help us. <laughs> because we are going to be in for, we're going to be deep in the trenches in a, in a battle. So let me just say that the, the appeal has been made tonight. And we're putting it all on the line as we go forward. This is not just about theory. This is not just about policy. This is about action, action to make a change. We're going to make that break for second base, make that break for a better America. We're going to take that risk. And I would just say, That in John 3, we're told those who would do evil love the darkness. And God bless them, even the New York Times can say something that makes sense sometimes. <laughs> they say on their masthead, democracies die in darkness. We're also see, are told in the Bible that God has invested in each of us special light. And we're not to put that light under a bushel, but to put it on a candlestick and lift high. When I was nine years old, I had the mumps. And my grandmother, who was 
a housekeeper for four families in Cincinnati. One, a professor was headed by, or the, the husband was a professor of, uh, at the University of Cincinnati. She brought me back, she brought me home a book, some novels, but one I was reading, it was about a little boy who also was in an infirmary. And the nurse came into his room at dusk, at dawn rather, at dusk, at dusk. And the little boy had his face plastered up against the window pane. And she said, little boy, what are you doing? He said, I'm looking at the man punch holes in the darkness. She said, what? She said, I'm looking at a man punch holes in the darkness. And she went down to the window. And what this little boy was watching in the early 1900s was the lamplighter go down the street lighting the lamplight. But in his eyes, the man was punching holes in the darkness. My challenge to us at this time when the candle lights are dim on this nation and it's getting dark and those who would do evil are in full force. Let's, in fact, light candles with our muscles, with our prayers, and with our money. And let us put our candles together. And let us punch holes in the darkness. And let us keep this country the shining city on a hill. God bless you. You know, I really love what he had to say about taking risk, how by default, just our human nature, we want to look for that equilibrium and not rock the boat too much. But sometimes you just got to put your own comfort level at risk and take that step and maybe be willing to feel a little off balance. What were your thoughts on all that? Yeah, uh, I mean, I thought his his talk was just so encouraging and a, a great reminder that we need people who are courageous champions who are willing to take those risks. And it, it can be scary. It can be scary to get involved in this. And I know politics is something that's a little intimidating to people, but we really need great people like him who are willing to step up. Yeah, because the feeling is it's messy. You know, there's there's some dirt out there. But, you know, sometimes we just got to be willing to share the righteousness, the light in the midst of all that, you know. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. Absolutely. Well, I did also think it was really interesting when he talked about how George Bush got 18 percent of the black vote in early 2000s. And then he gave his perspective on a margin of victory too big to rig is how he put it. Would love to hear your perspective on that. Yeah, I think he makes a great point. And uh, one of the things that folks may have noticed is that elections over the past few cycles have gotten closer and closer. And especially in Virginia, they often come down to just a handful of votes, sometimes less than a thousand in really competitive races. And, uh, you know, this is maybe a factor of our, our increasing political tensions, but it's also a factor of recent redistricting in a lot of states. Mm -hmm. um, so many of the competitive districts, not just in Virginia, but all over the country are very close. Um, and so to his point, uh, we need to make sure we get all of the conservative folks, the conservative voters engaged um, so that we can overcome those pretty slim margins of victory that we almost often see. Okay, tell us about some key districts to keep our eye on. Absolutely, yeah. So Virginia has three main uh, really competitive seats that we're looking at this year. The other ones are either pretty solidly red or pretty solidly blue. Um, so the first one is uh, currently held by Republican Jen Kiggins. It's the second congressional district, which folks may know as down in Virginia Beach. Um, she's actually the only incumbent running for a re-election in one of these districts. The other two seats are open. So the person who was serving before isn't running again. It's a huge opportunity for flips. Um, so we have the 7th Congressional District, which kind of runs along the I-95 corridor uh, around Fredericksburg, Spotsylvania, Stafford, a couple of those other counties in that area. Uh, there's two candidates running in that race. And then we have the 10th Congressional District, which is a little bit farther up in Northern Virginia. It includes Loudoun, a little bit of Fairfax, um, and that one's competitive as well. Uh, Family Foundation Action is going to be really heavily focused in the 7th, which is uh, sort of the most toss-up of the toss-ups. Okay, the one in the Fairfax area, that's interesting because I would have thought Nova wouldn't be as competitive. 
Yeah, well, it's only a, a small portion of Fairfax County, but certainly Fairfax has a huge population. Uh, but it also has uh, Loudoun County and some of the rural areas in, in, that, in that direction. So it outweighs uh, some of Loudoun's Big Blue Sink. Okay. And uh, uh, it makes the seat, uh, it still leans, uh, you know, in the Democrats' favor. But mm -hmm. it's possible that if we have great voter turnout this year on the conservative side, uh, you know, it may flip to a conservative candidate. Very interesting. And the other one that you mentioned, the seventh, that one's fascinating because Spanberger is running for governor, right? Yes. Yeah. So uh, the, the person who's currently serving as the member of Congress from the seventh is Abigail Spanberger, uh, but she has decided to run for governor as uh, the, a Democratic candidate. And so she's not running again for Congress. And she's been a, a really formidable candidate in past years. She's very good at retail politics and, and uh, pretty smart politically, and so she's been tough to beat for, for the Republican candidates who have run against her. Um, she's won by a couple points, uh, two, two different cycles in a row, uh, but very narrow margins, like I said before. So uh, with her leaving and kind of fresh faces on both sides, uh, that's going to be a really interesting race, and I, I encourage everybody to, to keep track of what's going on there. You know, there's also going to be some drama on the Democrat side because a lot of them are throwing their hat in the ring for the executive branch. And I know in addition to Spamberger, we had the Richmond mayor, LaVar Stoney. At first, I think he said he was going to run for governor, but then he withdrew that. And now he's got his hat in the ring for lieutenant governor. Yeah, yeah. So there are, are quite a few names flying around on the Democrat side for statewide offices next year. And uh, some flying around on the Republican side, although they haven't been as official uh, in their announcements yet. But yeah, LeVar Stoney, the, the mayor of Richmond, um, was running for governor against Spanberger. He had gotten some endorsements, made official announcements, uh, but Spanberger really seemed to have cornered the market uh, where, when it comes to Virginia Democrats. And so uh, she raised a lot more money than him. She had quite a few more endorsements. Uh, so he eventually kind of backed out of that. He's decided to throw his hat in the ring for lieutenant governor. Uh, but there's several other pretty competitive candidates in that race on the Democrat side. So I think we'll see uh, a hot primary between uh, Democrats. And I think Jesse's holding out for some official announcements for Republicans before commenting further on yep, the, that end yep. of things. We should, we should probably <laughs> see that uh, for folks who are, are curious about that and, and maybe a little bit anxious to see. Uh, we should start seeing those roll out after the elections in November. Okay, well, the good news is you, the action side, is going to have voter guides for all of this, right? Yes, yeah. So we will have voter guides for those key congressional areas this year. Uh, they're not quite done yet, but you'll be able to find them on the Family Foundation Action website uh, right before early voting starts. So before you're able to cast a ballot, you'll be able to take a look at those and, and really judge the candidates and, and who you'd like to support. Right. Very cool. Anything else you want to bring up before well, we wrap up here? I just want to make sure folks know that we are always looking for people who want to get involved to volunteer. It's very easy. We have uh, training programs and we love to partner with, with other conservative groups and, and folks all over Virginia. So like I said, we're going to be doing a lot of work in the 7th Congressional District this year. We'd love to have folks from there and, and we'd love to have folks willing to join us on a Saturday. Um, so if you're interested in, in helping out with that or if you're interested in voter guides and any of the materials that we have on the upcoming elections, feel free to check us out. It's familyfoundation.org slash join the movement. And we would love to hear from you. And I do just want to say thank you. I mean, you and Bruce, they put in a lot of blood, sweat, and tears. It's not just talking. I mean, they are pounding the pavement, knocking on doors. So thank you for the hard work that you guys do day in and day out. We are then, excited yeah. to do it, and, and we're looking forward to November. All right. Well, that's a wrap, folks. Don't forget to share our podcast playlist, Speak Up Virginia, if you're on YouTube. If you're listening through audio on Apple or Spotify, just give us that five-star review if you like what you're hearing. That helps us reach more people. And remember, we are stronger when we speak together.